What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Lane in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, which was an incredibly long time ago, it was the final bonus episode. It was showing off some of the locked content related to future installments in the series, and it's been many, many months since that episode. However, I do want to give a big shout out to the user Mario X Man, who commented on this playthrough after having watched through everything I'd uploaded and said, hey, you know, I've really been enjoying your channel and I really love the Professor Layton series and this game is incredible and there's still more to it that you haven't had the chance to play. And in fact, there were these weekly puzzles that were released that, um, well, they came out at the time, but I didn't realize how I could play them and they were kind enough to show me how I could gain access to those puzzles and wanted to see me go through them. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to revisit the game after kind of closing that door, but this is a game that I really enjoyed, and I don't know, I've, I've, it's been a while since I've been in a puzzly mood, and I really did have a great time with this game, so I figured I'd come back to it and hope for the best. And I hope you guys, even though it's been a long time since I last uploaded late, and are still looking forward to whatever these puzzles may offer. So we'll see how they go. So what we're going to do is hop into bonuses here. You'll notice that the save files are quite a bit different than they were last time, but they are going to allow us to access, of course, the weekly puzzle. So we can solve puzzles. And I love this little newspaper on the left. Puzzle times. Brand new puzzle arrives. Weekly puzzle challenge update. And this is just a very cool concept from Nintendo. I wish... I guess I wish that it was eventually available to everybody, right? It, I don't really like the limited time events, though I understand their appeal. Um, but it is a bummer that these puzzles were hidden for so long. But anyways, I guess I'm not used to seeing these dates. I guess this is 2008, February 17th. From 5 to 4. I guess we'll give it a go. Can I... Can I solve it? Oh, there we go. <laughs> wow, it's been so long, guys. Are they going to tell us how many pick rats it is? Oh, they're not. Well, I guess... Makes sense, right? We're not really solving for pick rides. It's not really relevant to our score for the game, but... Anyways, a set of matches are arranged so they form five squares. Interesting. I feel like that should be is, but never mind. Nevertheless, uh, to solve this puzzle, you need to change the number of squares below from five to four by moving exactly two matches. Your four squares must be uniform in size, and you must use all of your matches when forming the squares. Hmm... So, so we've got to move two of these, right? My first inclination is to look at this and say, if I'm, there are these two squares on the end, on the far right and the far left. If I remove two matches from those in, in any fashion, um, I'm going to be left with one outlier match. So I can't move any of those for sure. From five to four. Hmm. So, in order to do this, I need to have a net loss of one square. Hmm. I'm initially drawn to this sort of central big block of squares, right? I, I'm thinking like, oh, I could move this like this, but then I'm literally just kind of like transposing or, you know, moving one square from one side of this X in the middle to another. Do they have to be contiguous? I'm thinking if I were to move these two matches here. But again, even if I do that, right? I need to get rid of two squares with the matches I remove. And not have any outliers. So I think I need to be pulling from this central X. But at the same time, if I'm only moving two matches and I need to form a square, there needs to already be 
two matches in place for that particular square, right? So what's a good way of looking at this? I can't add a square on to the far right or far left. I would need three in order to do that. So again, it's, it's all in this middle section here. Those three squares in the middle. That's really what I need to be working with. The thing is, like, if I do this... Right? Oh, can I not even change the orientation of them? No, I should be able to, right? No, I can't. Which is pretty interesting, in and of itself. Well, I was gonna say, even if I do this, right? I technically have four squares, but again, all of my matches need to be used um, when forming the squares. So... I need to move two matches in such a way that I basically break up two squares and then I reform one of them. This is tough. I mean, maybe you guys already see it, <laughs> right? That's how these things tend to work. Maybe you guys already see it. It's definitely got to be in that middle section and they have to be uniform. So they have to be this small size because I can't change the size of all the squares, obviously. Or another way you could think about it is... Hmm, actually no, that's not a valid way of thinking about it. I could try to move two matches such that the third sort of lingering match forms kind of like a divider between two squares I'd potentially form. Just trying to get as much utility out of the, the match pieces as possible. Can I really not rotate them? Is that just something I'm not aware of? Oh, I can rotate them! That is very helpful. Ooh. Oh, I see it. I see it. Okay, um, sorry about that, but yeah, so if I can rotate this, I basically, yeah, I can move this one over here and then rotate it like so. I basically, I'm trying to think of how to, how to formalize this solution, but I'm fairly confident this is, yeah, the four uniformed for uniform squares, I needed to take two matches away such that I was destroying two different squares, right? So I couldn't pull two matches from the same square and I needed to form one square with them. So I guess that was a, a general tip. It is helpful that I was able to rotate the matches there, but I think that's gonna do it. Let's there see if Luke go. confirms our answer. Or Professor Layton himself. Another puzzle solved. Nice. For as simple as it seems, this puzzle actually requires a good deal of thought, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm trying to think of a better way to formalize it, but that definitely... Wow, maybe I'm a little bit rusty, guys. <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit out of touch with the latent, latent puzzles. So let's move on to this one, treasure chest. Although all six chests appear to be of equal value, in actuality, one of the chests differs from the rest. Choose the chest that has a different total value. So I'd imagine it looks like they have these different shapes and colors. We're going to want to make sure they all have the same amount, per se. I think that's the first step. And pretty easily we can see they all have two yellow stars. Those stand out quite a bit. Same with the blue squares. Actually, no. The one in the lower left corner has four blue squares, where all of the others have three. So that's concerning. Um, the red triangles, there are two of them in every one of them. The pink hearts, there are two of them in all of them. And then the green circles, there are four of them in all of them. Yeah, so D is going to be the one that has the different value. I feel pretty confident in that one. Luke, here's my answer. All right. 
So that one was a uh, puzzle solved. That one was a pretty quick one. <laughs> Good eye. This puzzle is all about how keen an eye you have for details. That was definitely a lot quicker than the from five to four one, right? So how many nines? Oh, whenever I hear the term nines, I think of near automata, which I just recently finished. How many times does the number nine appear within whole numbers between one and one hundred? So it's gonna appear once for every set of ten digits, right? From one through nine, and then you know ten through nineteen, and then twenty through twenty-nine, etc. So let's I, let's just <laughs> let's do this safe, right? So there's nine, and then nineteen. And then 29, 39, 49, 59, 69, 79, 89. So that gives us nine nines already. And then we have to consider the 90s, right? And so 90 through 99 is going to be an extra 10 um, numbers. And then we also have to remember that 99 itself has two nines. So that's 9 plus 10 plus 1, which should give 20. And I think that sounds about right. Yeah, I, th I think I'm pretty comfortable with that. Let's see here. Maybe the game will disagree. <laughs> but yeah, 90 through 99 is 10. And then 99 has an extra one. So it's 11. And then from the, the zeros, tens digit, right? All the way through eight, that's nine of them. So yeah, 20, I like it. That should do it. All right. It is admittedly kind of nice to not have the pressure of losing Picarats if I get the answer wrong, but that's right, the answer is 20. Even if you try to count the many nines between one and 100, it's easy to mess up and forget one along the way. What a tricky puzzle. <laughs> so tricky. Yeah, more about organization. Aliens, oh no, if this is anything like that other aliens puzzle, we're gonna be here a long time, guys. Long time. A famous space explorer has just discovered a new planet and landed on its surface to investigate it further. During his three-hour investigation, he counted 379 male octoplians, 493 male octoplians, and 125 that had the features of both male and female octoplians. So right now, how many aliens are there on this new planet? So... I guess something that's worth considering is, are those 125 that had the features of both male and female? Do we know that this explorer is including them in the piles of male and female? in those counts? If so, then what I like to do is actually make a nice little Venn diagram. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I like to make a Venn diagram for these types of problems. It's pretty helpful, where you kind of draw one circle that has 379 for male, a circle on the right that has 493 for female, and then an overlap in the middle that has 125. And basically what you can do is you can find how many individual male there are by doing 379 minus 125, which is going to be 254, and then how many exclusive female there are, which is 493 minus 125, which is going to be, what, 368? So. 254 and 368, which is like 622, I think. 354, let me, or 254 and 368. That is, yeah, 622. Okay, and then that's, and then there's the 125 that count as both. So I would say 747. Yeah, 747 sounds right. I 
I remember the fours used to give me trouble when inputting answers here. I think I've got it. Incorrect. I've let you down, Professor. Think again. Don't waste time with difficult tabulations. Consider what's really being asked here. Alright, I mean, we'll try again. Yeah, I mean, I'm fairly confident in the math here. So right now, how many aliens are there? On this new planet. I, I, I bet this is a wording thing. If the if the hint was basically don't worry about calculations, it doesn't matter all those middles or all those numbers in the middle. That's just a, a red herring. You know what? They don't refer to the Octoplians as aliens. They never specify what aliens are in this problem. They refer to the Explorer and the Octoplians. And so, from the explorer's perspective, the Octoplians are the aliens, but from the Octoplian's perspective, the explorer is an alien. So on this new planet, and especially if, again, the, the hint was to say, don't worry about any fancy tabulations, right? They're basically saying, from the Octoplian's perspective, there's only one alien, the explorer themself, themselves. That's, okay, it, it's clever. Again, you guys know me, right? You guys know me and the types of... And the types of puzzles I like. And I appreciate some wordy, you know, some fun wordplay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. But I definitely like some of the more logic-based ones more. But, right, the answer is there's one alien, the Explorer. From the Octoplian's point of view, this strange visitor from another planet is as alien as they come. I see, I see. But okay, it's fun, it's fun. So now we're moving into the March puzzles. Nose to nose. What's the answer? Nobody knows. That's that's pretty bad. But hey, I just I was just talking about how I like wordplay, right? Four horses are running around a course made up of several concentric circles. Horse A runs one lap an hour on its course. Okay, and that's the big concentric circle. Horse B runs two laps on two laps an hour on its course, and that's just smaller than A's circle. Horse C runs three laps an hour on its course. Horse D runs four laps an hour on its course. All four horses line up at the bottom of the circle and start running their courses at the same time. How many minutes will it take until all four horses are lined up nose to nose on a straight line again? Well, this seems kind of like a sort of like a least common multiple. Right? Um, so it seems like... Oh, I need to be careful. It's saying how many minutes, right? So it, it seems like it would be after 12 laps. We don't really need to worry about horse A. Um, because it'll line up with... Oh, actually... they give This is weird because they talk about it in laps per hour rather than time per lap. Right? So, when are they going to line up again? Now that's making it kind of weird, because it's not just how long will it take for them to get back to this, the starting point at the same time, right? It's how many minutes will it take until all four horses are lined up nose to nose on a straight line again, wherever that straight line might be. So... What's a good way of thinking about this? Because my, my initial impression is after 12 laps, right? Um, they'll all be lined up back at the start again. A will get back to that point every single hour. Um, and 12 is the least common multiple, right? Where it's, you know, after 12 laps, they would all be back at their starting point. But the thing, that's not the problem, right? It's, um, it's how many, how many minutes. 
So let's think in terms of lap, or how many minutes per lap, essentially. So horse A, I'm, I should actually write this down. Oh, I should have, I should have known I'd be bringing out the, the pencil and paper for, for the latent episode. So A is, uh, we'll say 60 minutes per lap. B is 30 minutes per lap. C is 20 minutes per lap. D is 15 minutes per lap. Okay. So when will they line up again? They'll line up again after an hour, <laughs> right? Um, after an hour, yeah, they'll all be back at the same starting position actually. Yeah, I think I actually like that after 60 minutes. They'll all be back at their same starting point. Will they will they line up in a straight line any time before that? I don't think so. Because at any multiple of Yeah, no, I mean it can't really be before then. As I'm just kind of running through multiples of, you know, the various lap times, right? So for example, at like 40 minutes, right? Uh, you know, A would be two thirds of its way through the lap. B would be one third through the second lap. C would be at the starting position, etc. So I, I really don't think they're going to line up before then. So I think it'll actually just be 60 minutes. And that's what they're asking for, right? <laughs> How many minutes? Okay. Not hours, minutes. So we'll, we'll try 60 and hope for the best. What? No! I'm so embarrassed. The horses must be lined up nose to nose, but the puzzle doesn't say anything about which direction they're facing. I hadn't even considered direction. Wow, I just assumed they would be running in the right direction. Um... Hmm. I hadn't even considered direction. I assumed they'd all be running in the same direction. All I can say is for certain then, it must be less than 60 minutes, right? Because that's the earliest they'll be back there. Oh, you know what? <laughs> um, so maybe this, maybe it's that they are lined up in a straight line, but they're not necessarily next to each other. Does that, is that what they mean nose to nose? I don't know if that's what that means. Because I'm thinking, so right now they show D, C, B, and A immediately next to each other, but what if A were halfway through a lap, for example, and was all the way on the other side of the circle? They would technically still be in a straight line with the other horses. Is that what they're trying to get at? Maybe. But even then, I'm not sure... Would it be like 15 minutes then? C is the thing that's throwing me for a loop. It's the 20 minutes per lap horse. Would it be after like five minutes then? No. Basically what it would have to be is that the, the relationship between the laps or the placement of the horses would, they would all have to be, you know, one horse would be have to be double the distance or position along its lap than the other horses, than at least one of the other horses. Either be in the same position or half that in order to be on the same straight line.
Something interesting is, I guess the hint mentioned the direction isn't mentioned, which means the direction must not matter. Which makes me think it has to be one of those halfway points. So let's think, after 12 minutes, A would be one-fifth of the way through a lap. B would be two-fifths through the lap. C would be, this is what, after 12 minutes? C would be three-fifths through a lap. And D would be four-fifths through a lap. Is that what I'm looking for? But I feel like if it's not if it's not a full lap, then the direction will end up mattering. Because Well, I guess part of it is that I shouldn't necessarily be thinking in terms of fractions. Actually no, fractions are helpful because the distance they're actually running is different. We don't know by how much. Because there's, there's no doubt that after 60 minutes, they would all be back at the same starting point. And so if 60 minutes is not the answer, it has to be less than that. But I'm having a really tough time seeing when they'll line up earlier than that. Oh, it's actually 30 minutes. How did I not see that? 30 minutes, I kept... <laughs> I kept doing 20 out of 30, and that two-thirds was throwing me off, but 30 minutes for the seahorse, seahorse, um, means it'll actually be halfway through another lap. So it'll be either, so it'll be across from its starting point here, B will be back at its starting point, A will be halfway through a lap, and D will be back at its starting point. So 30 minutes, yeah, 30 minutes is it. Oh, why didn't I think of that earlier? <laughs> But yeah, I'm fairly confident it's 30 then. It's got to be less than 60. And so I was thinking of, of multiples of that, but I think the key here is that they don't need to be at the same starting point next to each other. They just need to form a, a straight line, you know, diametrically across the circle. So let's go with 30 here. I think I've got it. All right. So that was it. That was, that was a lot more obtuse than I expected. Yeah, and so you guys can see... Um, it's not that they have to line up next to each other, it's that they can be on the same straight line at various points. Despite the, the horses will line up nose to nose 30 minutes after they begin running. Despite the fact that two horses will be on the far side of the track, the four horses will still be lined up nose to nose. That's, that's tricky. That's quite tricky. Oh, and so in their calculations, they put it in terms of half laps. That, that would have been helpful too. So that was, that was very clever. I like that one. Um, next up is cut the cake. And this is March 23rd, okay? I should check how many of these how many of these there are. This is puzzle number 6. Let's see. When viewed from above, the slice of cake below is an equilateral triangle. Your goal is to produce four sides of a cube by making one cut into the cake. Connect two dots to cut the cake. You should know that this particular cake has a thickness equal to one quarter the length of the cake slice. Well, this seems odd. <laughs> this is pretty odd. That this particular cake has a thickness equal to one quarter the length of the cake slice. So whenever we do make this cut, not that I'm making the cut right now, but this is the length they're talking about, right? 
And so we could think about this in terms of like, I don't know, the measurements they give us here, right? So this is set up into, you know, four equivalent units of, of length. Which means that when I, whenever I cut this, I'm going to need to create four sides of a cube such that they're one unit length, right? So I think that rules out any cut that's going to be like this. Or like this, for example. <laughs> I guess I can't draw any more lines. Um, so all of my cut needs to be one unit in length. Which means I'm really limited to the various triangle corners, but how do they differ? Right? If it's an equilateral triangle, it, does symmetry matter? Hmm. I guess... I guess symmetry might matter. I'm trying to differentiate the fourth, but even then... Oh, you know what? <laughs> Professor Layton doing the, the wordplay. Your goal is to produce four sides of a cube. Notably, not a cube. Because I was, I was trying to think, I was like, if I make this cut, I'm just gonna create this triangular structure, right? And then this awkward trapezoid trapezoidal structure, right? I'm not going to actually make a cube, and there's no one cut I can make to this, especially from, you know, any of the vertices they give me that'll create a cube. So, so we're producing four sides of a cube, which means that whatever triangular piece we do make is going to have three sides of the cube, and the one remaining side has to be on the surface of that large trapezoidal space, right? And it's probably going to be the side that we cut. So... So the real question is, which corner do we cut, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, if I had to pick one, the bottom left and the bottom right would seem indistinguishable to each other, right? Technically, this cake is not perfectly symmetrical due to whatever swirls there are in the bottom of it. But if we were to make a cut in the cake, in the lower left and the lower right corner, they would be identical. And maybe, maybe this is faulty test taking logic um, in that this game isn't like a multiple choice test, right? And those of you that have taken multiple choice tests, which is probably almost all of you, know that if two answers would, you know, if one answer is correct, then the other answer is also correct means neither of them can be the correct answer, right? You can't have two correct answers in a multiple choice test. And so if one of them being right means the other is also right, then neither of them could be the correct answer. That's kind of what I'm thinking about the lower left corner and the lower right corners of this cake, which is drawing me to the top corner. But I, I mean, I can't really think of much else. So we'll, we'll go with it and hope for the best. Well, here's my guess. All right, so I mean, it worked. I'm Wait, curious to see what they have to say about it though. That's right, cut the cake is shown here. The two newly exposed surfaces, along with the two additional surfaces from the newly cut wedge of cake, give you four perfectly square sides of a cube. Once you figure out that the thickness of the cake is the same as the length from any corner of the cake to the first marking, the puzzle is a piece of cake. I wonder, I wonder if they would have counted it correct um, for any of the other corners. Hmm, I don't know. How many, how many of these are there? There's a good handful of them. Yeah, so this might be a couple bonus episodes, guys. Let's see here, soccer ball. Uh, we, yeah, we've got time. I don't remember how long I made these episodes in the past. Soccer ball. The surface of your standard soccer ball is made up of several black pentagons and white hexagons, just like the ball picture below. The ball shown here has 12 black pentagons how many white hexagons does the ball have? Oh, uh, there should be, I think it's 20. <laughs> like, I think there's a formula for it, but I don't remember. So what am I gonna do? I'm probably gonna count more or less. 
Um, so there are six around this first pentagon, right? And then on the edges, right, there is an extra five. There's an extra five, isn't there? Yeah. And then presumably we could mirror that more or less on the other side. But the thing is, these black shapes are pentagons, right? So we're, we're seeing more of the pentagon than is going to be hidden on the other side. Let's see here. For this pentagon in the middle, we have... Oh, why did I say six? There are five. <laughs> there are five... Uh, hexagons attached to it. For every pentagon, there needs to be five hexagons, right? But for every pentagon, it's going to be overlapping, right? So we're, we're potentially counting more than necessary. So the question is, how much overlap is there? If there are 12 black pentagons, right? You might think, oh, if there's a hexagon for every side of the pentagon, that would leave 60. However, there are obviously not 60 <laughs> um, white hexagons on the soccer ball. For one of these pentagons, for the near, for the neighboring five pentagons, each of them is going to be sharing two sides with that original central pentagon, right? As a result, that would exclude ten, two from each of those pentagons. And then each of those pentagons is sharing two other pentagons with those neighboring pentagons. So, can I draw? I can. Okay, lovely. So we have our central pentagon here, right? And it has five hexagons around it. And each of these on the outside also has five hexagons around it. But each of them is sharing one of these, two of these actually, with the central pentagon. And then each of these outer rim pentagons is also sharing two hexagons with each other. That is not one of the first ones I mentioned. So these outer ones, right, are shared. So that's already minus 20. So I said, you know, originally starting with 60 and then we're basically subtracting for overlap. So if we subtracted 20 here, I think... I think we would subtract 20 more for the other side, right? If presumably there's an identical structure on the other side. And which, which I think there is. Because these hexagons, we're seeing three of the sides, right? So presumably this is a, this is, is this a line of symmetry? For the shape? Maybe, actually. It's something I should know more clearly, but... Yeah, so I actually think our answer is going to be 20. I think I'm going to go with that. And if that doesn't work, I'll come back and, and think about it some more, but... Here's my answer. Alright, that's it! Critical thinking is the key to success. No pentagon touches another pentagon. Three sides of every hexagon touch pentagons. That's right, if you pay attention to the areas where the black and white shapes share an edge, the problem is a snap. Hmm? If you pay attention to the areas where the black and white shapes share an edge, the problem is a snap. Oh, I see. So, that's pretty clever. But I, I still, I want to take some more time to really dissect this problem, because I know I, I wasn't thinking about that the most efficiently, probably. That's pretty cool, though. Pretty cool. What's hidden? It looks like this went on for... Quite a few months. I wonder why they stopped. Did they run out of puzzles? Not getting as many downloads? I don't know. 
Puzzle number eight, what's hidden? You've stumbled across a strange painting. It appears to depict a frog sitting out in the rain, but there's more to this picture than meets the eye. What other living creature is hiding within this picture? Your answer must be five letters long. Okay. What other living creature? So it, it appears to depict a frog in the rain, which is very much what I see. <laughs> um, there's another living creature hiding within this picture, right? So I think what's tempting is to look for what else would be hiding out in the rain, in the water, by a frog in this environment? Um, I don't think we're going to find that. I, knowing Professor Layton, <laughs> I think we're going to have to either rotate our heads 90 degrees or look for some other way this image could be drawn um, from, or viewed from a different perspective to find a completely unrelated living thing. So I'm going to awkwardly <laughs> rotate my, my head here, guys, <laughs> and see if there's... Anything else interesting? My voice probably sounds weird, too. Um, at first glance, I don't see it. And, and for what it's worth, this would be a lot easier to rotate if I had my DS. Maybe, maybe what I'll do, actually, what I'm actually going to do. Wow, I used the word actually quite a bit there, didn't I? I'm going to take a picture of it with my phone. And then, in my Photos app, I'm going to rotate it and see if I see anything different. What if I rotate it upside down? Another five-letter living thing. I appreciate that they at least gave a letter limit. I'm not seeing anything jump out at me immediately hmm I think part of it is gonna be maybe looking for awkwardly drawn parts of the, the picture it's like so there are obviously leaves blades of grass etc it's gonna be in the odd boundaries right it's gonna be the awkward in-betweens where this thing is depicted And the, the hind legs of that frog seem very oddly drawn. So maybe that's where I should be looking. And can I, can I draw? I can. I don't know why it's white this time, but... The segments of the leaves here also seem somewhat odd. Like maybe a snake? Is that maybe? I mean, it's five letters, but I can't really say that with much confidence, can I? A snake, goose, like this here. Looks like it could maybe be like a goose's head. No, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. I bet it has to do with this segment over here. Like if I flip that upside down or, or... I have to look in the negatives. Like the negative zones of this. But it's so tough. And part of what's so difficult about this is that they tell you it's a frog in the rain, right? And that jumps out immediately. But at the same time, now that you've seen that, it's so difficult to try to unsee it. Hmm. But I don't know. What other living creature? I'm like trying really hard <laughs> not to see the frog. <laughs> and I don't think it's working, guys. Maybe human? But I, I don't even really see a person's face. Not yet, at least.
I wish I had a better strategy for this type of puzzle. Because I feel like I'm a little bit lost just trying to think, okay, what are some, you know, typical ways they could hide an image, right? Changing the perspective, changing the angle, rotating the image, looking in the negatives, right? Not, you know, the positive boundaries of, of things. Like that one night beast or whatever puzzle that I still remember. It also can't be too obscure of an animal. Or of a living creature, I guess. Which is worth noting. Hmm. What other living creature? I mean, they use the term creature, right? There are other living things, right? Grass. Plant. <laughs> like, I don't know. Hmm. The way they use creature makes me think they're not going to refer to the, the plant life in the area. Maybe I'll... I'm, I don't know, guys. I'm going to think on this one, and if I have... If any thoughts come to mind, I'll be sure to share them. I wish... I wish... I knew... If I was, you know, on, even on the right track in terms of should I be trying to look for obscure ways of, of viewing the image to find this living creature or should I genuinely be trying to find this living creature in the way I'm currently seeing it? It's probably the former, just knowing Leighton, but I don't know. And that's partially making it difficult because I, I can't know that I've exhausted either option until I find the answer, at which point... Well, it's useless, right? I'm just trying to think, like, some five-letter animals. Squid, human, snake. I, try, I keep fixating on the frog. The frog definitely seems unnatural, right? And I'm trying to think if you, if you view it backwards-ish, it looks like it could be a bunny, maybe bending forward but that would be a very awkwardly drawn bunny like those hind legs <laughs> seem very off right like these hind legs seem really weird and then what's going on here right like is that is that a, it can't be the back leg there's some weird why like why is this line here I don't know but it seems off, and it's what I'm currently fixating on. But then how, every time I try to rotate this or look at it some other way, I have such a tough time resolving this clear head up here, right? With the eye and uh, the mouth. Unless, I don't know, it's like some dragon <laughs> crawling out of the water or something, where it has like a body that's extending out this way, and and these are like the lily pad or something it's like crawling out of from in the water and it's just like emerging I don't, I don't know guys I don't know obviously I'm kind of grasping at straws at this point maybe it has something to do with this region this also looks a little bit deliberate something hiding in here yeah I don't know guys I thought maybe maybe a tiger I think I think I'm going to go with a hint, actually, just in, in the interest of time, and like I said, I don't feel like I have a, a very palpable uh, path forward that I can really grasp onto and try to progress along. I feel like I'm just kind of grasping at straws, trying to think of different things, but I thought maybe with this area here could be perceived as like stripes, sort of, and maybe tiger, maybe snake in that region. Maybe there's something hiding under here that we need to infer would be there. Waiting for a frog. You know, maybe maybe these awkward legs are the opening mouth of something eating the frog. I don't know. Is there something hiding here that looks like a blade of grass that I should note is not a blade of grass? 
I don't know, I mean, there are these three sticking out here, right? That seems natural to me. I'm trying to see if there's something that's out of place. This area here is kind of weird, but I don't know what's going on with it, right? Like, what it would be... Just regularly. I'm trying to pay attention to negative spaces, right? Like, for example, what if I draw this shape here? What's what's formed by that? Some sort of bird diving in? I, I don't really know. But that's another thing I'm, you know, trying to keep an eye out for. Is this awkward shape here something? I don't know. Maybe that's something I should try to do, is try to draw shapes. Oh, I know! I see it! It's Pac-Man! <laughs> it's not Pac-Man. <laughs> um... Hmm. What if I draw the shapes of, you know, the, the water here? Is that going to reveal something? Does that distinctly look like anything in particular? Here's the here's the comment question of the day. This is a Rorschach test, right? <laughs> what do you what shape do you guys see in this outline? <laughs> Uh, I know that's not quite a Rorschach test, but, um, yeah, I don't know, I think I'm going to take the hint, guys. This, I, I've pointed out some oddities I've noticed, but I can't quite put them together yet, so, this puzzle's all about looking at the, pi the puzzle, the picture from a fresh perspective. Try rotating your DS to the side and see what happens. I already did that, game! I already did that! Try rotating it to the side and see what happens. Yeah, it's rotated. I mean, there are only two different ways to rotate it to the side. I'll look again. Is it on the left? With those, like, lily pads and stuff? Is it on the right? I feel like it has to do with the dead space involving the, the leaves. But right now, I'm not seeing it. I'll rotate it the other 90 degrees. I'm still not sure. All I can think of is that maybe this shape here is like some sort of tiger. That's all I can think of. You know what? We'll, we'll give it a go. I'll... I don't have pick rats to lose, do I, right? So we'll go with tiger. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> I'm gonna have to deal with this again. Okay, that was harmless enough. Uh, but oh, that's right, the E is tough. But we got it. Okay. So we'll, we'll try Tiger. Maybe it's like sitting, facing away from the frog. Nah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> How embarrassing. Yeah, if all you see is a frog, you might want to change how you look at this puzzle. I definitely tried that. I definitely tried. Let's see. We're gonna go straight to the hints again. Can I, can I get another hint? There's only one hint? There's only one hint, guys? What? I've already tried rotating my DS. Figuratively speaking. All right, I'll think about it for another couple minutes, and then we'll just, I don't know, come back to it. I'll, I'll sleep on it, <laughs> and we'll see if I have nightmares about this particular puzzle. All right, given that I've been recording for quite some time now, I think I'm going to try Snake. I kind of see it. I would bet that this is designed in such a way that if you see it, it's really um, quite definitive. You know, it's not something that you, uh, you can only sort of see. So I, I don't think that um, this will be it, because I don't quite actually see, but this will be go. my give it a go and maybe move on to something else. Yeah, that's not it. <laughs> so uh, I'll come back to this another I time. I felt wrong. We've only got one hint, so um, there's not a lot to work with there. 
So I'll think on that one. I don't want to end on a puzzle that I wasn't able to solve though, so... So let's do this one, a smaller E. The matches set before you are arranged so that they form the letter E. According to your friend, you can make the E small by moving just one match. Can you accomplish the task your friend has set out for you? By moving... Moving just one match. Oh, by adding. <laughs> so the idea is you can't really make a small uppercase E, but you can make a small lowercase E. I think that's what they were going for here. Because this is a lowercase E now. Otherwise, you couldn't make a small sort of three-pronged uppercase E. Yeah, we're going to go with this. <laughs> There we go. That one seemed pretty straightforward. Critical thinking is the key to success. That's right, a lowercase e certainly is smaller. <laughs> That's clever, albeit uh, not exceptionally outside the box. But anyways, Layton's hat box. I, I don't want to end on that one, <laughs> so let's let's try this one. Oh no, the professor's hat box has gone missing. Picture below are four hat boxes that have been broken down and flattened. When reassembled, three of the boxes are identical in every way, but the fourth hat box differs slightly in its design and belongs to the professor. Can you find it for him? Another one of these spatial reasoning ones. So, what's kind of interesting here... Oh, we kind of have to put them together. So let's see here. A is going to have... When we, when we fold it up, what's it going to have? <laughs> so it's going to have a... Uh, a cube, right? And it's gonna have two opposite faces that are blank and then kind of what I'm doing is I'm... can I move around? No, can I draw? No, I can't. Okay, so I'm basically starting at that lower blank space and kind of folding things in from there. So the first thing we're gonna fold in is that red hat and that'll form our left side of that cube and then after that let's see here um, we fold up that green, and so that'll form the next side of the cube. And then we keep folding, and that'll form the, the opposite blank side that I had mentioned before. And then we... Oh, man. So then we would have... We would be able to fold to the right. Yes. <laughs> and that would be the pink side. And... Then, does that, does that leave the spot that I think it should? Oh, you know what? <laughs> I bet we have to pay attention to the direction of the hats. Although in this one, they're all in the same direction so far. Yes. So kind of going from left to right, it's it's red and then green and then pink and then blue. And they have the two opposite blank spots. Okay, uh, let's do the one on the right. So the one on the right, if we kind of fold all of those flabs in from that blank center one, we'll get the blue on the left, the green on the right, and the pink on the, the bottom. And then What's also worth noting, though, is that when we fold, after we fold in the green tab, we'll get a blank side that'll be directly adjacent to another blank side, which is different from before. Yeah, so, so that's different, um, and it has adjacent blank sides. Alright, what about C? I think C and D, just based on the configuration, um, will, will not have adjacent blank sides, but let's look through it just to be certain. So with C, we'll start at that blank in the lower left and kind of fold in from there. So if we fold the pink, that'll form the pink on the left, and then we can fold the blue, that'll be our bottom, and then we fold up the red, and we fold the green in, and yes, then again we have another diametrically, an opposite blank and then let's so 
I'm not too worried about the order here, because I think the adjacent blanks are going to be the deal breaker. And, well, I guess I should compare the order. Well, no, if, if we know that A and B are different and C is similar to A, then B is inevitably the answer. But just to confirm, <laughs> let's look at D. In the, at the bottom blank space, if we fold in the red and then fold the green over, we form two sides there, our bottom and our left side. Then we fold the, green, the, the pink in and that forms our third side, and then we fold the blank side, which is going to be opposite the other blank side, and then we fold the blue in to form. Yeah, so, so A, C, and D have two blank sides directly opposite each other with the four hats all adjacent in the middle, whereas B has two adjacent blank sides. So we're going we're gonna to go with B. I think I've got it. All right. Professor, I've solved it. Good job! We all know how important the professor's top hat is to him. Ain't that the truth? Alright, so that was that was some good stuff. We got through nine of the puzzles, struggled with one of them. I'll think on that in my own time, but we still have a handful of puzzles left, which is quite cool. Um, I've been recording for a little bit over an hour. I'm sure some of that will be edited out because it was just pauses looking at a picture of a frog and something else that I haven't identified yet. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. I actually enjoyed this a lot. I was a little bit concerned that I wouldn't be ready to get back into Layton or warm up or would be worried about being rusty or whatnot or, or having already, you know, finished the game and coming back to it. But I definitely enjoyed the puzzle so far. Thank you again so much to Mario X-Man for... Um, you know, helping me gain access to these weekly puzzles, and I hope you guys are looking forward to the rest of these. And, and of course, the next Professor Layton game. I guess if I really like this, you know, maybe, maybe I'll start the Diabolical Box. Hmm. Maybe if I'm still feeling it after the next, you know, 10, 15 puzzles. But, until the next bonus episode where we do more of the weekly puzzles, this is Movie Night Zero, and this mission is complete.